Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to, to see you again uh, for our weekly updates. Uh, today, I'm here with Dr. Sukovic, Dr. Barry, and our patient navigation team, Katrin and Allison. Um, and as always, we'll provide some quick updates, and then we'll use most of the time to answer your questions. If you can go to the next slide, um, I really have the honor and pleasure of introducing a close colleague and friend, Dr. James Barry, also from Mass General, uh, is the regimen co-lead investigator of one of the regimens that we are testing in the platform trial. And, and, and for today, he's here to uh, tell us more about his experience with the trial and specifically describe uh, the important biomarkers that we are collecting as part of the trial. So if you have any questions about biomarkers, please, please feel free to start typing them in the, in the chat box. Uh, and then um, we will take them um, as we go along. So James, would you want to tell us more about uh, the trial and biomarkers? Yeah, thanks a million, uh, Sabrina. This is really exciting to be here and um, you know, really excited to be a part of it. Um, next slide. So, you know, the, the Huey platform trial is incredibly exciting. And the, the main thing that we talk about when we talk about how exciting it is, is the fact that um, we're testing now four drugs at the same time against placebo, but we're, because of the shared placebo, we're able to reduce um, the number of people who are on placebo. Um, and you know, we, can, we can come at the disease from many, many different angles in a very efficient way. And that's really what we talk about is you know, um, how, how, how we can test multiple drugs at the same time. There are some other hidden, really exciting parts to this study, which is that not only can we test different, different drugs at the same time, but that we can also test them in multiple ways at the same time. And we can do that in, in some ways that are tried and true, and in some ways that are more exploratory, and some that are something in between. So let's go to the next slide. What we call the primary endpoint for the trial is the change in disease severity on the ALS functional rating scale revised or ALS FRSR. What we mean by primary endpoint is that when we do a trial, we need to essentially, it's like calling your pocket in billiards. You say, listen, this is the thing that is gonna be most important and we think is gonna, gonna change um, and, and show us that in a, in a very reliable, acceptable way that is that clearly is tied to how a patient is doing or how, how a person with ALS is doing. And ALS FRSR um, sort of passes that bar. It is, a very, it is very much tied to function or how, or how a person is feeling, which is kind of a, the definition of a clinical endpoint. We then have secondary endpoints. These are, these are um, outcome measures or endpoints that we say, you know, they're not, they're not the, the, the main thing that we're going to look at and, and say, you know, this is most important, but they are still really important to seeing whether our drug is working or not. And those include things like vital capacity, strength testing using handheld dynamometry, survival. And then the last one that I'm going to focus on more is, is sort of biomarkers. Um, and, uh, you know, then we have some exploratory endpoints and there are some biomarkers and exploratory endpoints as well. These are things that we may come back to and we don't know as much about, about them at all and we're sort of learning about them. But one of the really, really important things about a trial like this is that if we have uh, biofluids, that is blood um, and, and spinal fluid and urine, we can, in a, in a, even after the trial is done, go back and ask the question, are there biomarkers that would lead us to the same answer? faster. Uh, so let's walk through some of the things that we're going to look at. Next slide. Because we're able to do this in this trial, and because we can do it with multiple drugs at the same time, as well as placebo, we really see our use of biomarkers as kind of an endpoint development engine. So let, let me just take a step back and say, for those, for those of you who, who haven't heard as much about it, that a biomarker is a characteristic that we can objectively measure and is an indicator of either normal biologic processes or a disease state. So it's something that we measure that tells us about how healthy someone is or whether they've developed a disease or, or where they are in that disease progression. Um, in this case, we're talking, um, I'll, I'll talk primarily about what we call biofluid biomarkers. So biofluids are anything that our body might leak. Um, 
uh, blood, spinal fluid, uh, urine, we're, we're full of these biofluids. And um, within those biofluids, we can, we can look for biomarkers by analyzing the biofluids in a specific way. One that we've included, that, that we've included provisions to analyze here is, is DNA. So increasingly, we understand that DNA is critical to all of what we uh, sort of do and, and, and um, how our, our bodies function, that there are, there are complex genetic inputs to our states of health. Um, and certainly, we know that, that some percentage of ALS is caused by mutations in, in DNA. But we also know that there may be um, impacts of, of other mutations on how, how a disease progresses, how quickly, how it responds to treatment, um, how our bodies process drugs. And we'll have that DNA so that we can ask those questions as sort of biomarkers. A lot of it is fairly exploratory still, but it will become more and more known over upcoming years. And having that DNA is really critical. One that I think we hear a lot about in ALS uh, a biomarker we hear a lot about is neurofilament. Neurofilament is a scaffolding protein in neurons. And when those neurons become ill, that scaffolding protein is, is shed into the spinal fluid and or into the blood. And we can measure it there and we can measure it quite reliably. And um, th this is correlated with how fast the disease is progressing so that it tends to be higher in people who have faster progression. It is elevated in a number of diseases, but it's very elevated in ALS, even compared to other neurologic diseases. And if we can correct or slow um, disease progression in ALS, we likely can reduce the level of neurofilament so we can follow that over time. And that's a really important uh, you know, potential endpoint here, potential biomarker. As we know more and more about this, we can then uh, go to the regulatory agencies and say, look, we don't need to follow people to see how long they survive or whether their ALS FRSR changes. We can actually just look at a change in neurofilament uh, and see whether our drug is working. Now, we may or may not get there with neurofilaments. We're not 100% sure yet. An example of where we've been able to do this is in the disease multiple sclerosis, where people have attacks of this disease and then it remits. Um, but even more quickly than that, we can see changes in an MRI. And we know that these things correlate and they correlate so closely that we can do trials in MS and just look at how the MRI changes. We are also collecting um, blood, urine, and spinal fluid for markers of, potentially markers of inflammation, poten potentially markers of mitochondrial function, potentially markers of, um, of RNA processing within the cells ones that are sort of on the horizon um, that we, we sort of keep a list within our biomarker committee of ones that, that, that may make a mark that may be ones that we, wanna, that we wanna follow up on so that we can develop those for future regimens and for um, understanding how the drugs that we're testing now are working even better. And then there are two biomarkers that, that we're including that are not biofluid biomarkers, but are digital biomarkers. Uh, in a way. One is a speech analysis. So this is uh, for people who are, who are in the trial, uh, making recordings of one's own voice and then using computer algorithms to parse that and, and understand how frequently pe people are pausing, um, what the um, sort of um, waveforms within their voice are doing and how that can inform us about how the disease is changing. And this may get us to um, sort of answers faster about whether a drug is working. And home spirometry can, can work just like spirometry we do for vital capacity in the clinic, but in a different setting and can be done more frequently. Next slide. I think, or I think that's actually the, the end of, of my slides. Um, I think we also want to pause here and, and take some questions. Um, actually, I, I think what we'll do maybe is just run through the rest of the slides and then we'll get to all and your questions. questions. Just quite okay. a lot of yeah, questions. So then in that so, case, Mary, I'll, I'll hand off you to yeah. To you to take from here. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. I uh, just a uh, quick update. So we, we are now up at 49 of our 54 first sites are activated and enrolling. And we were hoping to have the 50th, uh, that would be Mayo in uh, Florida, but they are uh, almost ready. But I, I think they'll be uh, activated the next day, um, if not tomorrow, uh, uh, Monday. So we'll be at 50. Um, if you have um, any questions about a site near you, you, uh, you can uh, go to our website. You can also reach out to our patient navigators, Allison and Catherine, who are on this call. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this is a list of the current activated sites. Uh, they're in order of the of activation. So the 49th one that just opened was the Ashner Health System. Next slide. So uh, we like to give the updates on enrollment. So 404 uh, people have signed informed consent. And, and I know some of you are on this call. So thank you again for being part of this study. Uh, of those 404, 313 have um, gone to the part where they're already signed to one of the treatment regimens and 275 are receiving the treatment. And 48 people have already started in the open label extension. Um, I know a lot of you are helping getting the word out and helping with recruitment and I really uh, thank you for that. Uh, recruitment has slowed down a little bit in the last couple months, I think partly from the, the COVID related surges. Um, however, we really do want to um, uh, get it speeding up again. So anything um, all of you can do to get the word out. And uh, if, if anyone's having any issue getting into site to really reach out to us. And by us, I mean um, Allison and Catherine, and they will help find the site that's open and uh, can see you uh, soon. Um, thank you. Next slide. So uh, this is Catherine and Allison who are here on the call. And this is how to reach them either by phone or by email. Um, and if you have any questions about the eligibility criteria, they're found on our website as well. Next slide. Uh, so uh, these weekly webinars are every Thursday. Um, they are recorded and put on our website. We also have done a series on the different uh, drugs and their mechanism of action, and those are recorded. Um, and I think uh, we've gotten some very positive feedback that those are really helpful to understand the science behind the, the current treatments. And we'll keep doing that as we add more regimens. Uh, next slide. Uh, we work really closely with uh, Niels, obviously, um, as uh, co-founders and members, and uh, the trials run through that trial network. Um, they are doing um, a drug development webinar series, and this uh, these ideas actually came from many of you on this call when we asked for ideas of uh, interesting webinars. So I just wanted to highlight um, some of them, though, though the next one will be Wednesday, April 7th, that Rick Bedlack and Jeremy Schefter will, will um, lead um, on um, kind of scientific considerations on trial design and, and bringing treatments to trials. And then we've invited some experts from um, industry to talk uh, after that on regulatory considerations, because we know there's a lot of questions that come into us here about, so we are really inviting some of the experts to speak with you. So please try, if, if you can make it to join those, they'll also be uh, recorded. Uh, next slide. So we love your our webinar ideas. So please keep sending them to us. Some of them we'll do here. Some we'll, we'll pass on to the Niels group if, if it's uh, broader than the platform, but we love getting your um, ideas. Some of the things we're gonna um, really focus on are around biostats and trial design. And we're gonna bring some of our site teams here so you can get to know them better. And with that, I think we'll go to some of the, for uh, you, James. So I'll start with the first one, which is what's the difference between neurofilament light and neurofilament heavy, and which is more associated with function in ALS FRS scores? Yeah, this is a really, this is a fabulous question. So um, I talked about neurofilaments as one thing. Neurofilaments are a category of proteins that all work together to, to act as a scaffolding for, for the cell. Um, we can measure different, different ones of these proteins. We can measure one that's called neurofilament light and one that's called um, neurofilament heavy. Um, and we can measure them in spinal fluid and we can measure them in blood. The, the, the levels of neurofilament le light and neurofilament heavy correlate quite closely. In fact, in spinal fluid, they correlate remarkably closely. Um, they, the neurofilament heavy in blood and in spinal fluid correlates with itself well. Neurofilament light in spinal fluid and blood correlates with itself well. When we come to blood, there are some dissociations. So there are some times where the neurofilament heavy and neurofilament light don't correlate perfectly, um, but they're still really quite close. Right now, I would say based on the measurement techniques that we have and some recent papers that came out um, uh, a, a, few, a few various groups that neurofilament light seems to have an edge on correlating with the ALS the functional rating scale slope. Now it doesn't it correlates with the slope, how quickly the disease progresses in an overall sense. It does not correlate with the actual number of the ALS-FRSR. 
So it tends to be um, um, sort of higher in people who have a more rapid progression, whether they're earlier or later in the disease and lower uh, and slower progressors. Thank you. There's a question about what does it take exactly for a biomarker to be validated and accepted by the FDA as a surrogate endpoint in ALS trials? Yeah, so, so there's a, there is a process that the FDA has kind of laid out for, for how we would um, qualify biomarkers as surrogate endpoints. Um, qualified biomarkers are, take a, a fair amount of work to, to sort of validate them. You do it within a certain context. So you say, I'm going to use this in a trial of ALS. And then, you know, there, there are a number of kind of um, validation steps that you have to go through. And there, there, you know, there, there's a lot of work that, that goes into that. Um, and, and there are actually levels of that sort of surrogate endpoint, a candidate surrogate endpoint, a validated surrogate endpoint, et cetera. Um, but to be useful in trials, we don't actually have to meet that mark necessarily. A surrogate endpoint takes the place of a, of a clinical outcome, but we can supplement a clinical outcome with a biomarker that has not been validated in that way, that doesn't have nearly as much evidence uh, for it. And I think that's important to remember as well. Um, so when you look at the placebo data, do you look at only the primary endpoint objective data, or do you also look at secondary endpoints, muscle strengths, and other biomarker uh, data as well? Yeah, gr another great question. So the, the placebo um, data is useful, not just for the primary endpoint, for, but for all of those endpoints as a comparator. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe this is for um, uh, Sabrina. Um, questions about the, uh, whether all the sites are testing all four drugs, and let's say if one site is only doing three right now, can someone uh, kind of reserve a spot and wait until all four are available at that, that site? Maybe you could explain that a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, the intent here is to have all sites uh, enroll for all available treatments at, uh, at all times. When we launched the trial, in fact, uh, we launched with three treatments, three regimens. And so all active, all sites that were activated at that time um, were enrolling in all three regimens. Now, because regimen number four uh, was added uh, a little bit later, um, all the sites that were already activated uh, had to basically do additional training just for that uh, fourth regimen. This is very important because, you know, it's important that uh, everyone is fully trained uh, and we have the exact same processes at all sites to ensure really high quality training and, and, and high quality processes and the ability to really tell if the drug is effective or not. So long story short, we are really working hard uh, to put uh, to, to have all sites activated for all four um, regimens. Uh, and again, most of them are there or, or almost there uh, and I expect over the next few weeks all will be activated for all four regimens. So that's the reason for the lag. In terms of waiting to, um, to, you know, to screen at a specific site, I mean, uh, sure, one can always wait. Uh, I would say that uh, all the drugs that we are testing Thing, you know, we, they have sort of the same um, scientific rationale uh, and same interest. Uh, so again, I think, um, you know, it, my suggestion will also be to consider enrolling, you know, uh, as soon as possible um, at, at the local sites. I'd say that um, when we add the fifth and the sixth that we're planning, our hope is that it will be much faster at all sites. I think this has been a learning curve for a lot of sites, plus the pandemic. Um, but our goal is to have them all uh, at the same time or near the same time going forward. There's a couple more biomarker questions, um, uh, James. So I'm going to combine two of them, which is, could the use of biomarkers potentially end the use of placebos? Or in other words, uh, if we have a real good surrogate uh, biomarker in ALS, would that eliminate placebos or could it? Yeah. So uh, another, these are great questions. Um, I think we can imagine scenarios where we use a biomarker like a clinical endpoint and it changes very rapidly and we can do a short trial, but we need a placebo to compare it to. That's one scenario we can imagine. So it would hasten drug development, you know, potentially dramatically and give us a, a much faster answer and potentially a more accurate answer with fewer people. Um, we, I, I can imagine a scenario where a biomarker could be used um, so that we have, you know, great data about what happens to the biomarker in general, and, and you know, we could not use a, a placebo and sort of incontrovertibly show that we've changed the natural course of that biomarker. Um, but I, I, I don't want to give the
in the Healy Platform trial. And that's why I've added in all those biomarkers. And uh, we're very grateful again for those of you in the trial who are doing those home assessments, because that, that's how we're gonna get the, these shorter term uh, potential surrogate markers. Um, so there's a question about whether the blood biomarkers that you were speaking about or all the, the outcomes measures you were talking about, are, are they part of the Healy Platform trial? Yeah, so these are these are things that are already built in, and we have kind of two levels of biomarkers. So I, I, we talked about the voice, and we talked about um, the home spirometry. We talked about neurofilaments. We talked about DNA analysis, and those are um, already a part of the the. They're already being analyzed in in, in the the Healy uh, study. The, there are additional kind of um, collections that we're making so that we can add additional biomarkers. So we're collecting plasma and putting some aside so that we could come back if a promising new biomarker comes comes out that, that we should analyze, we can do that as well. So we're, we're sort of taking a belt and suspenders approach there. Great, thank you. Maybe um, Sabrina can answer this. It's about what tests are done in the, the participants when they're in the open label extension, um, in particular around biomarkers and strength and Questionnaires. Yes, we, we uh, essentially the open label extension um, is an important study to collect long term safety and efficacy data, but we also wanted to uh, have a little bit of a balance in terms of data collected uh, and uh, kind of requirements to continue to do study visits on a long term basis and, and going in in person. So yes, we do collect some biomarkers, but with a little bit of a lighter schedule, only a few time points, uh, again, because we recognize uh, the time it takes, you know, to go to the center and spend time for all of this. Uh, and and we, we are not collecting mu uh, muscle strength testing, actually, uh, but because we, we thought we would, again, uh, sort of have a balance and consolidate uh, the most important information long term, which is the primary endpoint. So again, it's a little bit of, you know, wanting to uh, test uh, safety and efficacy, but also paring down the, the visit schedule so that it's more feasible. We're still getting very important information, though. So uh, James, there's a question, uh, two questions about neurofilm and I'll start with the first one. One is neurofilament suggests neurodegeneration at large, correct? We cannot tell which neuron population displays major uh, degeneration, right? From, from just that test. Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely right. So this is a scaffolding protein in, in neurons um, of which motor neurons are an important subpopulation, but neurofilament does go up in many neurologic diseases. Um, it goes up more in ALS than in many diseases, but we can't say specifically what it's for. Here, in this context of use in, in a trial, we already have a diagnosis, and so we're using it really to, to sort of follow over time from that diagnosis. Yeah, it's what we call a non-specific marker. Thank you. Um, so Sabrina, there's a question about amylex and neurofilament, um, which was um, if you could explain why phosphorylated neurofilament uh, um, was, was perhaps higher in, in, that, in that trial or didn't change? Yeah, so uh, so we measured one of the biomarkers that Dr. Barry explained, the phosphorylated neurofilament heavy chain, only in plasma, not in the spinal fluid in the amylix trial. Uh, the, the results actually were flat. So essentially, if you look at the table uh, in, in the paper, the, the, the actual numerical value appears to be slightly larger. But you know, based on the statistical test, th this is not sig uh, statistically significantly different uh, from uh, you know, when you compare active to placebo. So again, essentially, Essentially, uh, uh, we don't have, uh, certainly we don't have uh, evidence that it went down about, uh, you know, again, it, it was flat throughout the course of the trial with all the limitations of that particular assay. So I think that tells us that, we're, that blood neurofilament is not yet a surrogate marker in AOS, right? Because it didn't go in the same direction as clinical. So I think we do have to be really careful that we, neurofilament might not be the answer, at least in blood. Right. right. Just, yeah. We didn't do spinal fluid there. So we have, still have a lot to learn, but that's why we want in all these trials to be collecting uh, the blood and the spinal fluid if we can as well. There's a related question about um, amylix, which is um, there, there was an earlier study of just sodium phenobutrate that didn't show efficacy signal, uh, but now in combination with Tutka, there is uh, a peer commented that 
maybe all you need is tug tug. So um, we have the world's expert here, yes. Sabrina. If you want well, to come, all, all of you are, were part of the of the study, but basically, uh, you know, the, the previous studies that I mean that you did, uh, Dr. Sukovic, was uh, you know a small study of sodium phenyl butyrate that really was not aimed at testing efficacy. It was aimed at testing dose ranging and safety and some biomarker data, in fact. Um, and then there was a separate uh, trial of Tatka uh, that was also very small, uh, both for uh, below 40 participants each, uh, that suggested some um, suggestion of efficacy uh, with a very different trial design. So I, I think it's really hard to compare because really we're comparing completely different trials. Uh, so that the fact that, again, there was interest in a scientific interest from different independent investigators over time in each of the individual components tell, tells us that there is some interest. There's something there based on, on lab studies. Uh, and again, it was, you know, what, what we tested was the pharmaceutical grade combination. So again, uh, more to come on this story, but, but I think, you know, uh, we, continue, we will continue to learn more about this particular drug. I just say to be really cautious about interpreting any um, results from really small uncontrolled studies. They can really mislead, like, like the original uh, phenobutrate study, which we did, which was really to figure out dose. It wasn't an efficacy study, the same with the first time. Um, uh, so we only have a couple of minutes, so we'll go really speed, uh, speed answers. So James, are there blood biomarkers that can predict the disease progression of ALS? So neurofilament is probably the closest that we come to it. Um, and we've talked about the ways that it seems to be imperfect, um, but it does correlate with how quickly the disease progresses. Um, James, also, what's the significance of the biomarkers found in the neuron multiple sclerosis study and the fact that some appear to be the same biomarkers that uh, improved in the neuron ALS study? Yeah, that was a really interesting observation in, in those two studies. I think you know, to see those biomarkers change is, is really remarkable. I think this is where we have to do a lot of work to correlate the biomarkers to the clinical outcomes. And this is why, you know, we, they, are not, they are not sort of validated surrogate endpoints yet. Um, we have to understand that. But it's, it was remarkable, wasn't it? So is there a way for um, patients to have neurofilament tested through, through the blood outside of the study? And also, is CSF required in the study, in the platform? James, do you want to answer? So CSF is not required in the platform trial. I think because we know that the levels of neurofilament are, are more reliable, and we haven't even talked about some of the markers of inflammation, uh, much more reliable in spinal fluid. We, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have in a good part of the study. Not required, though. Um, are there ways to test neurofilament outside? Um, I, I'm not certain that there is a CLIA, what we call a CLIA certified, a, a kind of clinical lab yet, but there are, there are moves toward that from a number of angles. Great, thanks. Sabrina, are the 404 individuals who signed informed consent counted as enrolled participants? That's a great point. Yes, so they are counted as um, enrolled in the study. However, I do want to mention that if some of those did not um, meet eligibility criteria, they will not be counted towards the total number of people in the regimen. So, for example, uh, you know, if uh, let's say we need 160 people for each regimen, if some people were assigned but didn't qualify, then we still need to find the you know 160 per drug. That's why we show about 70 of the 104 have not um, gone on to, to uh, go to a regimen for various reasons. Um, so uh, there's a question, same biomarkers are uh, tested in each regimen. James, you nice. great. So it's a great question. The, the biomarkers that I mentioned already are being tested across the platform trial. There are specific biomarkers that are being tested within, reg, within some of the regimens that have a lot to do with what's the level of the drug and you know, maybe the specific mechanism of the drug and not specifically, not, not ALS broadly. So uh, uh, Sabrina, if someone had prior ALS and so the, the way we plan the trial is that people who previously received um, stem cells in the spinal fluid, such as in the brainstorm study or the quorum stem study, uh, they can enroll in the HILI trial after appropriate washout, which is 30 days. 
Um, will the raw data from the outcome measures be made publicly available for data scientists not directly associated with the trial? I'm happy to maybe answer that one. And, and yes, that's the long-term goal, is that, that this data would be put into something like PROACT, which is an open source data that um, our group, Alex Sherman, put together from prior trials. The only caveat is that as long as we're using the placebo data, uh, let's say we're using the placebo data from regimens A through D, but we're using them for regimens E and F, we can't share them until we stop using them. And we want to obviously keep using them as much as possible so we can keep the number of people in placebo low. But as soon as they're kind of, quote, retired, they can go into an open data set for other scientists to use. That, that's definitely our priority. So someone asked, um, and this is a hard question, my treatment period ends tomorrow, and my health has declined. Are there any other promising drugs that might cure ALS? And Sabrina, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, th thank you for, for sharing that. I mean, I, I think we are all trying to uh, develop as many treatments as possible. Uh, I would say, you know, it's important to discuss with your um, investigator at your set uh, to see what, what could be the best option for you at this point, whether to enter the open label extension or, or try maybe another trial or an expanded access option. There's a question if we give the CPT codes for some of the blood biomarkers uh, so that um, less experienced neurologists might be able to order them. I don't know if J James, you want to just kind of clarify that about those tests. Yeah, so so these tests are, are generally not available clinically. We don't we don't have CPT codes for them. They're 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 essentially in the in the research realm still. Neurofilaments are moving toward the clinical realm and um, but 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 they're not quite there yet. Um, gene testing we can do for ALS genes, for example. Um, but I think I think even even neurologists don't know don't don't work with ALS a lot would know that. Yeah. Uh, James, have you investigated using big data analytic analytic approaches to combine ALS MRS and biomarker results into a more robust composite multivariate based indicator of disease progression? <laughs> it's, uh, um, wow, what a what a what a question. So I think that. Um, uh, there's been a lot, yes, there, there's been a lot of kind of effort in some of our observational studies to, to try to do something like that. Um, and I think until we have biomarkers that, that we're pretty sure are represent the underlying biological process and are, are, are a little more less variable than we have right now, um, it's going to be a little difficult. But I think we've had a lot of practice flexing our arms at doing that. And when we, when we have these good biomarkers for trials, I think, I think that's the way we want to go. It's so a question of how many more participants do we need in the study and in each regimen. So I'll say that we need about 70 each for uh, regimens A, B, and C, so 210. And then we're just started on, on D, so we have about 20 people in D, so we need another 140. Um, but, um, so, but thank you. I know a lot of you are helping get the word out and being part of the study, so um, it help us cross the finish line there. There's also a question, how many participants are providing CSF during the platform trials? And Sabrina, I don't know if you want to Yes, I, I have to say I don't have the exact number with me. Uh, I believe it's about a quarter, uh, give or take. Again, it's uh, that's what we wanted. Really, we wanted uh, sort of you know uh, a percent, you know, a portion of people to donate uh, spinal fluid because it's very powerful and we can do a lot of analysis even if some people donate and, and the majority doesn't. So there's a, this is a tough question, but I'll, I'll ask James here. Several critical biomarkers were able to be correlated to ALSFRS changes in the neuron trial. Would your expertise generally consider this correlation to be significant good news? And was there any similar correlation seen in the, in the AMLEX trial? This describes um, kind of how, how much do things move in the same direction um, or exactly in the opposite direction. And um, I think there was there was correlation in, in that study. Um, I, it, it was not ter terrifically high, but it may mean that the biomarkers explain some of the movement in, in the um, ALS FRSR. Um, and there's a lot more work to be done there, I, I guess is what I would say. Um, and I'll let Sabrina maybe talk a little bit about the AMLEX study. Yeah, so the, the AMELIX trial, uh, to be honest, it was not a biomarker driven trial. It was really meant to test clinical efficacy. So yes, we did measure the one biomarker that we mentioned that didn't move, uh, but that was not the focus of the trial. The trial was to see if people on the drug would have better function, would retain better clinical function and, and would survive longer. So that's what most of the, you know, the, the results are about. So we only had the one biomarker basically. 
and then the, uh, just to the last question, I know we're out of time and I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything, but uh, why does the FDA allow more flexibility for unvalidated biomarkers like dystrophin for DMD versus the biomarkers in ALS? Yeah, so this comes back to the question of um, how much work do you have to put into knowing about a biomarker before you can make it a, a before you can use it in trials? And the answer is, um, actually, in early trials, you can use biomarkers that you have confidence in really fairly freely. Um, and then, you know, but then you have to sort of make sense out of them when you, when you get the results back. Um, and, and we're trying to do some of that here in an exploratory way. Um, and then, and then there's the question of, you know, when does a biomarker become so good that it can be a surrogate for, for an endpoint? And that's, that's a bit of a higher bar. But I think, you know, the FDA says pretty clearly, you, it does not have to be a kind of qualified biomarker through this formal process in order to be considered a, a, amongst evidence in, in studies. But it may not be the primary evidence you, you may need a clinical endpoint to. So I'm gonna end on the question kind of related to the question about are there promising cures? And I'll, I'll just say that we've never been at this stage in ALS where there's so much science going on and so many companies and so many ideas. So I really do think there's a lot of promising drugs, both in the platform trial, but also other trials uh, really around the world. So it's, uh, it's good that we have a lot of groups working on, on keeping tabs of all these trials and ke keeping information out there for neurologists, but most important for people with ALS and their families. So thank you everybody for joining again. We'll see uh, hopefully all of you next week. Thank you, James, for joining us. Thanks. Thank you.